Welcome to AIN Debrief, where we take a deeper look at the most important or interesting aviation story of the past week with the AIN editor who covered it. I'm AIN News Editor Chad Trotvetter. In this episode, AIN Editor-in-Chief Matt Thurber describes what it was like to fly the Joby Electric Vertical Takeoff and Landing aircraft simulator at the company's Washington, D.C. office. The simulator is built to look like the cockpit of the real Joby aircraft, and it uses X-Plane simulation software for visualization and terrain display. But the flight modeling is all Joby developed, and it was surprisingly easy to fly. This podcast is sponsored by business aviation sustainability solutions company for air. Okay. So Matt, uh, you just recently went to Washington DC, uh, actually for the uh, Collier awards uh, dinner. Uh, and while you were there in town, you actually stopped by Joby aviation uh, and they have a simulator. So uh, why do they have a simulator for their EV tall in DC? Hi, Chad. So it was actually an interesting contrast because the Collier Trophy was for Garmin's Autoland system, which is basically an autonomous system that can land an airplane in case the pilot gets incapacitated. So Joby is developing a so-called eVTOL or electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft and they have a government affairs office in Washington, D.C., and it's a good place to show various potential stakeholders, investors, and government officials what it's like or what it's going to be like to fly this unique aircraft. So uh, what kind of setup do they have? Is, is this like a Microsoft Flight Simulator, like an X-Plane type uh, setup, or is this like a, a higher-end system? It's higher end in that it uses the actual flight model and aerodynamic software from the Joby aircraft itself, but it also runs on X-Plane's visual system. So what you're looking at outside is basically what you'd see using X-Plane's desktop simulator, X-Plane 11. And what kind of controls does it have? This is where it gets kind of interesting because you have basically two controls to work with. You have no no rudder pedals, nothing for your feet to do except sit there. And you have on the left-hand side a speed control. It's kind of like a throttle. It goes forward and backwards, but it's to control the speed of the aircraft, not necessarily the power that's being applied, although essentially that's what it's doing is varying the power. Then on the right-hand side, you have an inceptor or side stick, which controls pitch, bank, and yaw. And because you have no pedals like rudder pedals for your feet, the yaw control is part of the inceptor. All you do is twist it to the left or to the right to to get yaw, kind of like a side stick that you'd use with a desktop simulator. You're a rated airplane pilot. You actually, you have several type ratings in jets. Uh, I know you had some helicopter instruction previously. You don't have a license, but you've, you've had some instruction. So does that background help or hurt? Uh, is this totally different? Well, it helped me, I think, in terms of figuring out how flying the Joby differs from a helicopter or airplane because I could understand the different control interfaces. But in terms of actually flying the Joby aircraft, previous experience I don't think made much of a difference except that I'm used to being in the air and I'm used to what it looks like and maneuvering in the air. But other than that, I think this is going to be very easy for non-pilots to learn to fly. So let's talk about your flight. Where did, where did you go to and from? We had, we had the simulator positioned at Reagan Washington National Airport. And 
I took off from there and flew down to Roslyn a little ways at about 1,100 feet and just kind of did some maneuvers to get a feel for the aircraft, then circled around the Pentagon and landed at the Pentagon heliport. It was a fairly short flight, but I was able to get a lot out of it. Before we get into what it's like to transition between helicopter mode, I guess, and airplane mode, uh, let's take a quick sponsor break uh, for 4Air, which is sponsoring the podcast today. Now more than ever, taking to the sky means taking responsibility for the climate-altering emissions released into our environment with every departure. That's because the future of our shared planet, along with the freedom of mobility that defines our way of life, depends on today's pursuit of absolute sustainability. There is no one solution, but with 4Air, you can advance every pillar of aviation sustainability. Learn how to make your flying part of the solution with a comprehensive sustainability commitment for individuals and operators alike. Visit 4air.aero today. That's numeral 4AIR dot AERO. All right, so we're back. So, Matt, can you just talk about the transition from helicopter to airplane, what it was like, how the controls work? and what you thought of it. The interesting thing about flying the Joby is that you don't really feel like you're transitioning between one mode to another. Like a helicopter, you have to think about, okay, now I'm, I'm going to take off into a hover, and that's one, one kind of maneuver. Then you have to think about, okay, now I'm going to go forward and, and translate into forward flight. And then, then you're cruising along in forward flight. In the, in the Joby aircraft, all you have to really think about is where do you want to put the aircraft? And it does all the thinking for you of how it gets there. That's the easiest way I can think of to put it. And how long is that, did that take you to get used to? just minutes. I mean, it really felt completely natural to me. Like, for example, to take off, you could say it's kind of like a helicopter because you just pull back on the right hand inceptor to pop it into the air and then let go. And it just sits there and hovers. So you could sort of equate that to a helicopter with a modern autopilot. You can kind of do the same thing. Now, for takeoff and landing, you're going to be in translative rate control mode, which limits the speed to, it's, it's going to be a low level. Uh, in the simulator, it was seven to eight knots, but it, it's probably going to be bumped up a little higher. But it makes it easier to have precise control when you're close to the ground. If you move the speed control from that hover position, you're not going to jump forward at 50 miles an hour. It's going to keep you a fairly low speed because you're close to the ground. You don't want to be blasting around. So does that, does that lever uh, transition between like a hover and like a forward flight then? Is that how you do it? Once you're off the ground <clears throat> uh, and you're still in translative rate control mode, you can just go forward or backwards. You, you know, you push the speed control forward, you move forward. Push it backwards, you move backwards. You can yaw to the right or left by twisting the right inceptor. You can climb by pulling up. You can descend by pushing down. Then once you're out of translative rate control mode, all you do is ask it for speed with a speed control by moving that forward. And then... Put the aircraft where you want it. Do you want to be climbing? So you pull back on the inceptor to set the nose in a climb. Do you want to turn? You push the inceptor to the left or to the right to bank. And yawing, you really don't need to do when you're moving forward because yawing is pretty much just a small movement you do when you're close to the ground. 
but it, it basically responds to your requests in a really natural way that you don't think about. Now, in the simulator, you don't get to see what the uh, electric propulsion units are doing. And outside on the, on the airframe, you've got these six propulsion units tilting up and down, powering forward, powering straight up. But while you're flying it, you don't really think about what they're doing. They just do whatever is needed to give you the response that you've requested from the flight controls. And I think it would be really interesting to fly in the real aircraft to see these things and how much they're moving. I think that would be a interesting piece of additional information to have, although not having to think about it, I found was pretty amazing. It, it frees up your brain from focusing on manipulating the controls to just asking the aircraft to do something and it responds quickly and precisely. And how was the information presented to the pilot for like PFD? Um, also, I know that one of the areas that Avidine had brought up is how do you um, show remaining energy? Cause it's not a, you don't have full and empty on a battery either. Um, you can have differing stages where your know, battery may have 25% power left, but you can't get a, you can't get a hundred percent of what you need for maybe a takeoff. So how do they present all the information to the pilot? Is it typically, is it kind of what it is now in a regular airplane or is there, was there some special way they were presenting this? It's, it's somewhat similar. It's the cockpit basically is Garmin G3000 avionics with a touchscreen controller, and that's fairly familiar to a lot of pilots. But the display is unique to the Joby aircraft. You do have a fairly normal primary flight display with airspeed, altitude, flight path marker, uh, attitude indicator. And there's some other... Uh, depictions on that instrument that I would have to get more training and to understand what they are, but it's, it's not, it's not complicated. But then on the right hand side of that main display, you have an indicator that shows what the propulsion units are doing, how much torque each one's pulling and how each one is tilted. So you do have that information on instruments anyway. But there's a lot more I need to learn about this, especially with regards to how the battery system works and how you know how much energy is available. Right. Well, it's definitely a different world. Absolutely. It is a different world. But it's what's interesting about it is that they have figured out a way to make the pilot interface so simple that a lot more people will be able to learn to fly these machines safely and it'll open up new piloting opportunities for a lot more people who really either don't have the time or money to learn how to fly an airplane or helicopter or who might not even have the capability of the effort it takes to learn to fly a normal aircraft and how much time it takes to stay current and proficient, which is really a big burden when you think about it. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see how the FAA treats this kind of licensing for these airplane for these aircraft. Exactly. I mean, what's is it going to be a new license? Is it going to be uh, a subset of another license? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure, but I do know that Joby's working closely with the. Uh, FAA's Flight Standardization Bureau on the training protocol. So that's all part of the certification process. Right. And I imagine the FAA's probably been in the simulator too already. So I'm sure they have. <laughs> all right. So uh, let's, before I let you go, Matt, um, I know uh, speaking of a whole different, whole new world, uh, 
Uh, the AIN January issue is going to be completely new. Uh, uh, AIN is also celebrating its 50th anniversary, but we're also redesigning the magazine. So um, do you want to tell readers about that and what's going on and what they're going to see when they get the January issue in their mailbox? Thanks, Chad. Well, I don't want to take away from the surprise that's going to happen on January 1st, and but I do want to let people know that uh, something different is coming and keep an eye on your mailbox. We have redesigned the print issue of Aviation International News. We've got a beautiful new design, and we are very happy with the way it looks. Now, it is smaller than the previous tabloid size, so don't be surprised by that. But there's a lot of uh, exciting new features in the issues, and we think it's going to be a winner. Yeah, and actually, the uh, it's it's not going to be a typical – it's going to be more like the BJT size uh, versus the tabloid size that everybody's used to, right? Exactly, yep. So it's an oversized. It's still an oversized format, uh, but it's just not as big as a tabloid. Exactly, but it'll be easier to fit in your flight bag. <laughs> so, uh, is there any change to content? So the the content is is changing in that we're going to focus in the print issue more on in depth feature type stories and the latest news is going to live on the AINonline.com website. And AIN Alerts. You can sign up for AIN Alerts. <laughs> yep, AIN Alerts e-newsletters. So please please make sure you sign up for alerts and come to our website, which is actually being redesigned as well. And you'll be seeing something on that in the coming months. But by the time news gets into a print issue, it's kind of stale. So we decided that the current news was better off focusing on the newsletters and the website. Okay, excellent. So everybody can keep an eye out for that. All right, thanks, Matt. Thank you, Chad. Thanks for listening to AI and Debrief. Another podcast episode will air next Friday. In the meantime, go to www.aionline.com for the latest aviation news from AIN. <laughs>